loves, and welcome back to not the Horus Heresy this time. No, 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 no. Taking a brief break from that one, uh, simply because the next in the series, um, The First Heretic, is probably one of the most significant books in the entire series. If you want to know why the heresy comes about, how it happens, how it begins, this is the book you need to read, and I want that uh, discussion to be more than just me rabbiting on into the microphone. I want that to be an actual discussion with people who have read the book. So, that's going to be a big video. That's going to be a very, very big video. Probably at least as long as an episode of The Fluff and Hammer. Uh, there's that much to deal with in it. But in the interim, I thought I'd take a look at one of my favourite uh, series of books from the Black Library, which actually deals with the more present day uh, 40k setting uh, and that series is the Araman series by John French. Now Araman is easily one of my favorite characters from the Horus from uh, the Warhammer 40,000 setting, the arch sorcerer of the Thousand Sons, the author of the rubric that reduced half at least most of the legion to animated suits of walking armor and piles of dust. He is Probably the most powerful of the Thousand Sons, arguably one of the most skilled and knowledgeable psychers and sorcerers in the entire 40k setting. Arguably on a level with someone like Eldrad Ulthran um, from the Eldiri. That's kind of the level that Araman sits at. What I've always found fascinating about the character is that in contrast to, say, Khan the Betrayer, who has given himself over so totally to his patron god, there's nothing left of the man he was, there's nothing left of Khan's personality. He's just like an avatar of corn. If no, there is nothing else left to him. Araman is the total opposite. He's the polar opposite. Araman does not actively serve Zeech. In fact, he doesn't actively serve chaos at all. He is beholden to none of the chaos powers. Um, he just happens to please Zeech quite a lot. Zeech likes him. Uh, Zeech finds him amusing and useful, basically. Um, he represents a very particular archetype of the followers of Zeech, or rather the puppets of Zeech, in the sense that by endlessly striving and struggling against the fates that Zeech prescribes for him, he inadvertently actually fuels and powers Zeech. It's that desire to to be more, to transcend, to free oneself, that actually feeds the core emotions that are part and parcel of Zeech. So there's not much Araman can do, really. Araman is in a very peculiar situation in that regard. He is at once favoured by Zeech and, let, and yet endlessly struggles to be free of the demon god. Absolutely, in fact, loathes Zeech and loathes the chaos powers in general and still, still seems to cleave to some utopian notion that the Thousand Sons exhibited even before they fell to Zeech, that somehow humanity could harness the warp and conquer the gods and transcend as a result, can reshape the universe around themselves as a result. That seems to be still what he's striving for, even 10,000 years later. Now, John French's series is really interesting. Like a lot of the books that deal with the uh, Chaos characters, it takes certain core elements of the character, the sort of general overview that you get from the background books, and then embellishes them massively, or emphasizes certain rather niche aspects of those characters. So, in Araman Exile, which is the first book in the series, when we first find Araman, he doesn't even call himself Araman anymore. He's... he's it's in the uh, the centuries directly following the rubric. He's exiled from the planet of the sorcerers. His cabal has been dispersed. He's got no followers, no allies, no friends, nothing. But there are entire cabals of the Thousand Sons Legion that are attempting to hunt him down. So he's basically gone into disgrace and hiding. He's calling himself Hawksos, which is apparently an old um, Prosperine name. Uh, it's an old Prosperine word, which means disgraced or out of luck, basically. 
and he's kind of serving as the lieutenant as the the pet sorcerer for this petty warlord this renegade warlord in the eye of terror um this nobody this nothing who's probably from one of the latter day renegade chapters he's just he's basically a beaten dog araman is so disgusted with himself he's so He's so dejected. He's got nothing left at this point. Araman is just desolate. Everything he has ever believed in has turned on him. Everything he's ever strived to do has failed. Uh, and he believes that the ideology of the Thousand Sons itself has completely failed. Um, the fact that Magnus the Red is now a demon primarch of Zeech kind of demonstrates that. The fact that the rubric failed so spectacularly, the fact that the heresy failed, everything they once wanted, everything the Thousand Sons once believed in has been inverted. Um, and he he acknowledges, the interesting thing about Araman is he is insightful enough and he is intelligent enough to understand that he's been played that he has been nothing but a puppet of Zeech this entire time. And that's why he's doing what he's doing. It's why he's gone into anonymity, as it were. He knows that waiting beyond death is this demon god, this vortex of power which is waiting to claim his soul. So he can't just kill himself out of despair. That, that would just compound his miseries to the nth degree. But also, he can't really go on following his own agendas because if he does Zeech and the demons of the of the crystal labyrinth will just manipulate them and turn them on themselves again because that's what they do um so he refuses to acknowledge his legacy he refuses to acknowledge his his condition as a sorcerer as a psyker as a thousand son basically he hasn't used his powers in decades when we first come across him he refuses to access the warp because he's come to the conclusion that all corruption flows from that font he's almost come interestingly he's come to the same conclusions that fabius bile has if you read the books uh, about fabius bile um written by josh reynolds it's the kind of the same conclusion, um, but from different precepts. Um, Araman refuses to be the puppet of Zeech anymore. So he is nothing. Unfortunately, without the prescribed destinies, without the patronage of Zeech, he's nothing. He's got nothing. He's just this slave. He is this puppet to this petty warlord. And the only reason... He is dragged out of that self-imposed exile is because his brothers come calling. The, uh, one, of his, um, one of his brothers from the Thousand Sons Legion hunts him down and finally finds him. And he has no choice but to defend himself, to access the powers um, that he's been keeping bottled up for God knows how long. And of course, Araman is still the arch sorcerer. He, he, he is still the most puissant, the most powerful, the most knowledgeable of all the sorcerers of the Thousand Sons. And this brother that comes to claim him just can't stand up to him. Um, when he unleashes himself, when he finally erupts, it's, it's like a, it's Armageddon, basically. Um, Araman is... He just... He's naturally gifted in the manipulation of the warp in the same way that Fabius is naturally gifted within areas that like genetics and surgery and whatnot. He just knows how to read the rhythms of the warp and to manipulate them to his own, um, his own patterns and his own will. And it's that that kind of drives him on to seek a better way. He knows that he can't linger in exile forever. So he sets about creating his own cabal, creating his own warband of, of exiled sorcerers from all over the shop. They're not just Thousand Sons, the ones that finally flock to him. They're from everywhere. They're from all over the universe. Some of them are even loyalists, briefly. They are loyalists who encounter him and end up disgraced and end up having to side with him because they have no choice um it's really fascinating he exercises these very complex relationships with his underlings and with his fellows he never intentionally sets out to manipulate them it seems it's just that things ha circumstances happen to fall in such a manner 
that he has no choice in doing so, or that that's the best way of bringing about his ultimate agendas. And he is supremely manipulative. I mean, he is able to, in the same way that Eldred Ulthran and the, the Farseers of Ulthway are able to read the strands and rhythms of the future, so too is Araman. And he is constantly trying to bring about certain contingencies of fate and destiny that will lead to particular situations and it's a very long game he seems to be playing it's hard to tell exactly what he's doing john french really does play this very clever game where he gives you some insight into the way araman works and the way araman works is really interesting he's very like magnus the red in the sense that araman inside his own head is not just one person he's too complex for that there are actually many varied personalities and states of consciousness that operate at once and sometimes in synchronization and sometimes at odds with one another so he's actually often in conflict with himself and sometimes you get a look at that you actually get an insight into the way his psychological state works he has a very very like Hannibal Lecter he has this very elaborate memory palace um, which is created from Lots of scraps of memory and experience, places that he's been, uh, states that he's dreamed or uh, envisaged. Um, And he often wanders the memory palace looking for some scrap of knowledge that he's lost or that he's half forgotten. It's really interesting. He's a fascinating character. He's emotionally complex too. What seems to drive him more than anything is... There's, there's this really bizarre tension between hope and despair in Araman. He knows that the way the universe currently operates, the way the warp and the material universe operate, needs to, needs to change. It needs to end. Because without that change, without there being some incredible shake-up of the dynamics between warp space and material reality, then... All of creation is damned, basically. There's no way you can escape the manipulations of the chaos powers or of warp entities. So what he's trying to do is upend and rearrange that entire metaphysics. It's it's very... His his plans and his agendas are long-ranging. They're very far-ranging indeed. There's a lot of characters in this book that, that... we originally encountered in Graham McNeil's uh, Horace Heresy book, um, A Thousand Sons, and you get to see them as they are now, which is really interesting, where they come from, what's happened to them over the last 10,000 years. He's, the way Araman is written, he is, yeah, he's a manipulative bastard. He definitely is. He's incredibly arrogant. I mean, he's actually trying to challenge the gods. So, you know, he is incredibly arrogant. But at the same time, At the same time, his logic is fairly impeccable. He knows what has to happen, and he knows what needs to be sacrificed to get there. What's really interesting about him, he's kind of selfless as well. He's not after power for power's sake. He's not after authority for authority's sake. He wants to change things. He is a genuine revolutionary, which sadly um, is how he tends to empower Zeech, because those kinds of minds tend to, the ones that want to better their states or to change the, the, the status quo, they're the ones that empower Zeech. And he knows this. He's aware of this. And he fights against it constantly. He's the fly trapped in the spider's web, you know? he's. It's really cool. It's so interesting. It's so interesting. And you get get to understand how he's operating you get to understand why he's doing what he's doing and how narrow the portrayal of him is in the general background books this is a really good series it's one of those series that elevates the material massively that takes it to another level that introduces elements of ambiguity and intrigue and mystery that are really necessary because Araman needs to be complex in order to work. He can't just be like a mustachio twirling villain. He can't just be um he can't be a simple archetype, and he's not in these books. He really isn't. What I really like is John French is a good enough writer, a deft enough writer, that as you're reading, you get hints and insinuations of what Araman might be doing. But you don't 
get the whole picture and the whole picture doesn't become apparent until towards the end of the book and then you get to understand then you get to see and in that regard you often share perspective with a lot of his underlings with a lot of those who encounter him uh, he is a mystery he's a perpetual mystery he's impossible to predict impossible to preempt because he's thinking a million steps ahead of you he's already anticipated your reactions and your thoughts and your ambitions and your agendas before you have them that's the point of araman and he's constantly fight he's constantly walking that very narrow tightrope he's trying to balance all of those plates at once all of those spinning plates and that makes him really fascinating it makes him really interesting and at the end of the book it's just intriguing to know where he's going and what he's going to do what is it he wants having broken his self-imposed exile uh what is it he wants to do which is something that we'll find out in the books that come after so yeah when we come back ladies and gents we will have a look at the next one which is araman's sorcerer uh until then my dears bye bye <laughs> Ha 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 